All right, what's happening everybody? This is Dave with AD Aquascaping. We're gonna go ahead and give this a second try. I took down the original video just because I was a little rusty and I was forgetting some of the, the precautionary, precautionary procedures. So we're gonna go through it again. I don't wanna be giving out a bad advice to beginners, to people that are getting into a CO2. Um, you know, I don't want them to accidentally ruin their regulator. So we're just gonna go ahead and run through this again. So if you're new to pressurized CO2 and you want to know how to set it up, this is going to be a setup video. I'm going to talk more in depth about optimizing your CO2 and also how CO2 and oxygen levels relate to fish respiration and hemoglobin in a different video. We'll call that part two. So this is going to be part one. This will be the setup video. In part two, we will be talking about fish respiration, hemoglobin, and of course, different methods on how to measure your CO2 and basically optimizing your CO2 in your aquarium. So let's go ahead and get started. So of course, first off, you're gonna need some kind of cylinder. I just have a five pound stainless steel cylinder. I use the exchange program at my local welding shop. Um, I find that beveragefactory.com has some of the most competitive and best prices for five pound aluminum cylinders. And so what I do is I order my five pound aluminum cylinder off beveragefactory.com and then I bring it to the welding shop and they do an exchange with me. I give them the empty one and then they sell me this full one for about $14. Their prices have gone up, they used to be a little bit cheaper, but I'm not complaining because this is a brand new stainless steel five pound cylinder. So again, you can pick up an aluminum one at beveragefactory.com, they have great prices and of course this is full of liquid CO2. Up next of course is the regulator. Now let's talk a little bit more about this. Uh, this is a really nice dual stage regulator. This one isn't out on the market yet in the United States, but it will be out on the market very soon for a very competitive price. It's very high quality, has a good Murloc fitting right here for the bubble counter, has a nice lo uh, locking needle valve. Um, great design, dual stage stainless steel, a really easy adjustable knob for the working pressure, everything like that. So of course I'll show you how to set it up here in a second. Um, solenoid valve as well. So in the aquarium hobby, let's talk about this for a little bit. Usually we have it on a solenoid valve. Uh, we set it to a timer. So of course you also need a timer. And what a lot of veteran hobbyists have found, you know, such as Tom Barr, is that if you just turn the CO2 on two hours before the lights come on, and then turn the CO2 off an hour before the lights go off, that seems to be a, a good method. If you turn the lights, or if you turn the CO2 off an hour before the lights go off, you're already at full saturation, around 30 parts per million. It just saves on CO2, it saves on money. Uh, if you turn the CO2 on, the CO2 on two hours before the lights come on, by the time the lights come on, the tank's already at full saturation, you know, basically close to 30 parts per million of CO2. Um, also, we usually run the working pressure between 30 to 40 PSI. Um, I've been running this one and it likes to sit at 50. And there's nothing wrong with that. Usually if you're using an inline uh, CO2 diffuser, uh, you do need a higher working pressure. Uh, if you're doing an in-tank diffuser, usually you need lower. So usually it's between 30 to 40 uh, PSI for most regulators. So let's go ahead and talk about that. Let's get into the diffusers. So of course, here's just a cheap in-tank diffuser. Comes with a built-in check valve. Uh, the only reason these are great is just because it's inexpensive. And there's also studies that suggest the actual mist coming in contact with the leaves of the plants um, can help. So you want a combination of uh, total dissolved CO2 and actual CO2 bubbles hitting the leaves. So this does create a pretty good mist, um, which can be uh, actually better for you know certain plants in certain situations. But most people, they don't like the Sprite water that it creates. I don't really like the Sprite water that it creates. That's why I use an inline CO2 diffuser, and you'll see here in a minute that I'm using a Greenleaf Aquarium's inline CO2 diffuser. And the reason the inline CO2 diffusers are so nice is because they create a mist, which is good for that physical contact of the bubbles hitting the plant leaves, and they also dissolve a lot of CO2. So it's kind of the best of both worlds. A lot of people like the reactors, the CO2 reactors, because they completely dissolve the CO2, but again, uh, evidence suggests, suggests that having some bubbles hitting the leaves uh, is actually better in certain environments than just having all the CO2 dissolved. So once again, I believe that the inline CO2 diffuser 
is actually the best of both worlds. And we'll show that here in a minute. Um, I use an Up Aqua inline CO2 diffuser. You can also buy it under the brand Greenleaf Aquariums. Uh, so yeah, that's basically, you're gonna need a diffuser, of course, so cylinder, regulator, diffuser. Um, here's a bubble counter. Now a bubble counter is just a good reference to let you know uh, the amount of CO2 you're putting into the aquarium. Now, different bubble counters will have different size bubbles, and so they can give different bubble speeds and everything like that. So it's more or less just a reference. You're still going to need to use a CO2 chart. It's also a good idea to use like a drop checker. And we'll talk about that more in part two when I talk about optimizing your CO2 and everything like that. But for this, a method that you can do, and you don't have to do this method, um, it's only for extreme situations, but what you can do is you can monitor your CO2 over a two week course and you can slowly up your CO2 over the course of two weeks with the needle valve until your fish start hyperventilating and then you can tone the CO2 back down and then when the fish stop hyperventilating that's your CO2 limit and then you monitor what bubbles per second you're at and then you can take a video of that with your smartphone and you can use that bubble speed as a reference for future setups. Now, you don't have to get your fish to hyperventilate and a lot of the times if you have high oxygen levels from a good surface agitation, from having a lot of agitation, your fish won't ever hyperventilate. Now we're going to get into that in the next video when I talk about fish respiration and everything like that, but if you do have really good oxygen levels, you can actually pump more, more CO2 and your fish aren't necessarily going to hyperventilate. So for me, I just use the bubble counter. I have experience. I can tell when I'm good. I'm at good valleys of CO2 just based on the mist. But if you're a beginner, and of course you don't want to make your fish hyperventilate because that is somewhat inhumane, you can use a drop checker. Now, of course, the drop checker is a great indicator. It has an indicator solution. It shows you based on color when your pH has dropped to a specific value. So basically when the indicator solution turns green, it means you're roughly at 30 parts per million of CO2. Um, and that's just, you know, that's just a level that we like to run our tanks at. It's an optimum level. It's satisfactory for plant growth um, to have, you know, 30 parts per million. Some people run their CO2 even higher than 30 parts per million. Some people run it lower. Um, but we'll talk a little bit more about drop checkers and optimizing your CO2 in the next video. Again, the bubble counter is just a good reference. And I usually just use water. And I just fill it up about three quarters of the way because if you fill it up all the way, sometimes the water can shoot into the tubing. Um, as well, this bubble counter has a built-in check valve. So you don't really need to use a check valve in the line. So with my inline CO2 diffuser, I don't have a check valve because this one's installed into the bubble counter. So of course, no water's gonna go down through here. So that's a little bit more about that. Um, of course, up next, you're gonna need some kind of seal. Um, you know, here's a nylon seal right here, and then here's a perma seal. Now, perma seals last a long time, and the way they work is you basically put the seal into the cylinder like this, and you screw it on. And it will work um, for multiple fills. And usually you'll need to get a four millimeter Allen wrench to screw that on like so. And you don't want to do it too tight or you can break it. But of course, when you go to refill your cylinder, if you're doing the exchange program, you just want to make sure to take it off because they'll probably just end up throwing it away. So that's the perma seal. That's how you install the perma seal. You can get those for like five bucks online, usually from Greenleaf Aquariums or Amazon. If you're using just a regular uh, seal, you're going to want to actually install it into the regulator like this. So you just put the vinyl seal down in there and then of course attach it to the cylinder. So of course you need one of these or basically, you know, you're going to leak a bunch of CO2. So that's very important. Um, up next, of course, you're going to need some kind of CO2 tubing. Now I've done a lot of research and I've come to the conclusion that flexible beverage grade PVC tubing is the most superior tubing when it comes to reactivity, permeability, and just PSI. So uh, flexible beverage grade PVC tubing has the least amount of reactivity with CO2 has one of the lowest permeabilities with CO2 and it has one of the highest uh, PSI ratings, which would make sense because it's beverage grade 
flexible PVC tubing so it's used for carbonated soda. Now you can get this tubing at usplastics.com. So companies like ADA and Greenleaf Aquariums, they're just selling you beverage grade flexible PVC tubing. So again, you can get this at beverage, or not, or sorry, usplastics.com. Um, so that's what I use. And yeah, it works great. Up next, of course, is you're gonna need some kind of wrench to attach the regulator to the cylinder. Now, in the last video, this is one of the reasons I did the remake. I was using vice grips, it's a really stupid idea, don't do it, just get yourself a nice crescent wrench. You know, I went and found my crescent wrench. You don't wanna tear up the bolt on the regulator. Makes it a lot easier, of course, if you get a larger one. You know, this is a 12 inch crescent wrench. You're gonna have a lot of, rev a lot of leverage. It's gonna make it really easy to attach this to the cylinder. So let's go ahead and do that right now. Let's just go ahead and set this up and I'll show you how, how I do it. And then we'll set it up um, next to the tank and I'll install it to the inline CO2 diffuser and we'll get everything rolling. So, you know, it's, it's not very hard, but what you wanna do is you want to make sure that your working pressure is t the valve is totally open so you want to turn it counterclockwise and have it really loose see well, it's almost too loose right okay well that's a little bit too loose but you do want it loose okay so yeah I screwed it all the way off but anyways so you want it loose and I'm trying to be too safe and you want to have the needle valve open to some degree as well Okay, so you just want to get that all ready uh, before you open this up. So right now we just have this open, this open. We haven't plugged the solenoid in yet, and this is totally closed. So let's go ahead and install this to the cylinder. And I'm going to go ahead, put my nylon washer down in there. First, you can just hand tighten it on. to go. It always seems to be the case. Just want to be not, go nice and easy. There we go. Okay. And because this knob is pretty close to this gauge, I'm going to kind of have it up at an angle. And it also makes it easier to tighten it with the wrench. Okay, and you can hold the regulator like so. There we go. Okay. Make sure you hold it nice and tight. And a lot of instructions on the websites like Greenleaf Aquarium, they actually say to tighten it as tight as possible. Some people are saying you don't have to, but I've found if you don't tighten it pretty tight, you're gonna get leaks. Come over on this side. Okay. There we go. Okay. Just want to make sure I get it on there pretty tight. Not ridiculous, but okay, that should be good. Okay. So that's basically it. Everything looks good. Now, just to test it, we're gonna go ahead, before you open this up, you want to plug the solenoid in. So I'm gonna go ahead and fit this into the Murloc fitting. Nice and easy. I have the needle valve open just a little bit. Okay, and that's what the instructions say to do. So you have this closed, you have this open all the way, plug the solenoid in, and then open the needle valve up a little bit. So here we go, we're gonna go ahead and turn the cylinder one full turn. Okay, so we're at about 900 PSI. Now this may change just depending on the temperature of the room. Of course we have this totally open so there's no uh, working pressure. So let's go ahead and bring up our working pressure. Here it comes. Okay, we don't really need that on. It's safe. Now these are just uh, precautionary procedures so you don't accidentally blow up a valve in the cylinder. So let's go ahead and just set this to around 40 
because I have found with using inline CO diff CO2 diffuser, sometimes you have to set it around 40. Okay, so we're at 40. We already know it's working, but we'll just go ahead and test it again. Slowly open the needle valve. Okay, there we go. So we know it's working. Let's go ahead and set it up uh, to the aquarium. Okay, so I've got it all set up right next to the aquarium, and I've got it plugged into the timer. So here, real quick, is my inline CO2 diffuser. Now, I install it really close to the top of the filter um, for a couple of reasons. If you install it close to the top of the filter, it makes it really easy to clean when you take the filter apart. And periodically, you will have to clean uh, inline CO2 diffusers with a plumber's brush. Also, it just gives the CO2 more time to travel up the tubing. So that way, once it gets into the aquarium, there's a lot more mist. Obviously, my tubes are actually very short. I've got my filter right next to the aquarium. And believe it or not, if I'm standing a few feet back, I can't see any mist. So if you had really long tubing, you had your filter underneath in a cabinet, um, if you get close to the aquarium, you can still see mist, but it's nothing like an in-tank diffuser. There is a lot less mist from an inline CO2 diffuser, and there's a lot more uh, dissolution of the CO2. So again, I advocate for them. I think they're really nice. Uh, periodically, you, you will have to clean them, but also just as an aesthetic aspect, you have less stuff in the tank, so once again, it's very nice to use. So let's go ahead and just hook the tubing um, up to the bubble counter. I've already got the threads connected in there like that. And I found it's easier once you get to this point, put it over the nipple like that, screw the bubble counter onto the cap instead of the other way around. That way the CO2 is not getting all kinked up, or the CO2 line, I mean. Okay, so we got that nice and set. Put this secured into the Murloc fitting. There you go. Go ahead and feed your tubing back. And you can cut your tubing and everything, but for now, you know, this is fine. Go ahead and get it back there. Okay. Now, of course, I'll go ahead and fit this onto the inline nipple. Nice and easy. Okay, we're ready to rock and roll. Let's go ahead and open up the needle valve. And I'm going to set it to maybe about two bubbles per second or so. Whoa, okay. Sit here for a minute. Okay, that looks about good. That's about where I had it previously. So I'll just set it right there, and we'll watch the fish. Um, I had it set up previously, and you know, I've been watching the fish and they don't seem too concerned about anything. Um, I do have really high oxygen levels, so that gives you a good idea. I mean, mine are pretty extreme, yours don't really need to be that extreme. I am wasting more CO2, but with a higher CO2 to O2 um, gas exchange, uh, it's actually more stable. And so the flux is more stable, and the more stable your CO2, the more stable your environment, and it can actually uh, reduce the chances of an algae outbreak because you actually have a more stable gas exchange when you have a higher surface agitation. So again, my fish aren't gonna have any issues. And yeah, I'm going high tech. We're gonna bump this tank right along. We're gonna get those stem plants really popping in the back, get those coming up. So yeah, this concludes uh, how to set up a pressurized CO2 system. Up next will be a part two. We'll talk about the fish respiration and, of course, different methods on measuring your CO2 and optimizing your CO2. Uh, thanks for watching. Until next time, everybody, keep your sleeves wet. Peace out.